During the last century, the second half of it, the European country that came closest to revolution was Portugal. The country hadn't been modernized at all during the years of the dictatorship. And it was the combination of the liberation struggles in the African colonies of Angola, Mozambique, and Guinea-Bissau that, curiously enough, radicalized Portuguese soldiers and young officers who had been sent to fight them. And the mechanisms were very simple. In order to fight their enemy, they had to read the works that the enemy was reading. And this, in many cases, meant Ho Chi Minh, Vo Nguyen Giap from Vietnam, Mao Zedong from uh, uh, China, uh, many other uh, writers of that period, uh, Franz Fanon, for instance, who was being read by the Africans, and a lot of Portuguese soldiers and officers said, reading these little books made us understand that many of the ideas were right, that we could never defeat these people. And as they began to come home, a mood developed against the dictatorship as well. There were strikes, there were demonstrations of a small sort, and these coalesced in the last months of 1974 into what became a revolutionary upheaval. After the crash of 2008, Portugal, a tiny country embedded in the European Union, suffered from the crash and nearly went under. It was saved, within inverted commas, by the uh, ECB and the Troika, but the price it paid was very high. Today, I have as my guest in the studio Caterina Principe, a social activist, a member of the left bloc in Portugal, and engaged in many struggles from below in that country against precarity, against unemployment. Caterina, welcome. If you read The Economist, The Financial Times, the conservative press in Europe as a whole, they talk about Portugal as a good country. And the reason they like it so much is they say, look at what its people have suffered. And yet they have behaved themselves, that there is massive unemployment, there's been a 40% recession, the worst in 40 years. Many of the policies implemented have created more poverty. Even the European Commission report on Portugal says that these policies have created more poverty, but the Portuguese have taken it. Now explain to me why, if that is the case. Well, um, I believe it is not the case. Um, it is true that uh, once the, the first me memorandum or the first austerity um, government was elected in 2011, the discourse, the narrative of the inevitable was a very strong one. So what people said on the streets and what people actually believed was this was our fault. We, de we did leave um, above our means and our possibilities. So it is only fair that we have to pay it back. Um, but this discourse uh, started to shift in the, next, in the next two years, until 2013, where there were um, not only massive general strikes, but also the biggest mobilizations since the revolution of 74-75 in Portugal. The last one being on the 2nd of March 2013, where one and a half million people took the streets in Portugal. And it's important to say this is a country of not even 10 million people. So it is not true that people did not organize and did not um, express publicly their grievances against the Troika and against austerity. But because this, not, this did not provoke a political shift and a political earthquake, a little bit like what happened in Greece for the last two years before they elected a left-wing government, people were disappointed, are frustrated, individualized. That's what's also what austerity does, what poverty does, unemployment does. does. Uh, and, and precarity very much. It individualizes our, our lives and our experiences. Um, and so because this massive waves of mobilization did not bring anything about, did not uh, bring any shift about, people went back home. 
um, demotivated and with no perspectives on how actually to change the circumstance or the situation that we're in. And I think that brings us to an important question, in my opinion, which is precisely the strategy of the social movements and the political parties on the left in Portugal. I believe that we lack, for many years, a very clear, rooted, daily form of organization uh, that continues the struggle and the organization uh, on people's daily lives, so that organizes in the communities and the workplaces daily. So when you don't have that, you can have very big moments of mobilization, very big moments where people come out and actually show that they're not happy with the situation, that sometimes kind of um, make the, the ruling class tremble a little bit. But because there are no solutions for the daily life problems and, the, and there are no structures for daily life organization and organized struggle, this kind of melts into air, so to say. Isn't it also the case, Katharina, that <clears throat> the emigration from Portugal has been huge? I'm told that proportionately the number of young people who've left the country to go and find work either in Brazil or in Angola or you know, other places uh, is much, much larger than similar events uh, and movements in, say, Ireland or Poland or Spain or France or Italy or Greece. What explains this flood which is leaving the country? And doesn't that also deprive you of some of the most intelligent, talented and capable people? This new flux of migration happening uh, in Europe is similar in, in all the countries, but uh, it is very strong in Portugal. It is true. I think Portugal, it is also, it was not the second country to apply the memorandum. It was the, th the third, Ireland was the second, but it was in a way where the austerity measures were applied very hard, almost as harsh as in Greece. So uh, to compare it again, um, I think the, the, the migration movement of young people, but not only, also of uh, older people, um, because if you're middle age and you lose your job in Portugal, you will never get back into the labor market. It's impossible. So there's a lo also a lot of people that are not young and that are not like the most educated generation that are migrating. But it is for sure true that, especially in the first years, um, I think the numbers are around 150,000 a year young people basically leave the country. That's huge. Yes, it's, it's more than half a million people have already left. Um, and yes, people live to Brazil, people live to Angola, but they also live to other countries in Europe. Mm. To Britain, for example, a lot of people are here, uh, especially because there is a facility with a language. Uh, a lot of people move also to Germany. There's an interesting uh, report of the OECD uh, about precisely the migration from Southern Europe into Central and Northern Europe, uh, reporting that for the first time there is a massive flux of migration happening inside OECD countries. Because normally fluxes of migration, like mass flux of migration, happen from countries that are not OECD into countries that are OECD. And for the first time this is changing. The reasons are, I think, uh, of course, besides austerity, unemployment and so on, there's other two that affect young people very clearly. The first one is the complete disintegration of higher education in Portugal. Um, not only with the implementation of the Bologna process that happened overall Europe, but also with the rising fees, student fees, tuition fees. And the second thing is the, is the question of precarity. This is a central question to understand why so many young people leave. Nine in every ten jobs that are created new in Portugal are precarious. And uh, so that means that the, the young people, when they reach the labor market, nine out of ten are un work under precarious situations. And by precarious, let's define it further. Yes. They work one day a week, two days a week, two they hours a week. Yes. Or, Two hours a day, what? A lot of people have no contract, so they, they are said, they are told every day whether they should come back the next day or not. Uh, a lot of people, uh, we, the way we define precarity in the anti-precarity movement in Portugal includes a lot of aspects. Um, one is the complete lack of any contractual relation. 
The other one is uh, part-time jobs. Or for example, you take a job for six months, you, you are in, under experiment for six months, and then after six months you're sent away because people don't want to make you a contract, so someone else comes in your place, so then you're again, again out of work. Um, we consider it also part-time jobs, subcontracting companies, which are huge in Portugal, but also a very particular thing, which is actually a contractual fraud, um, which is called in Portugal the, 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 what we call the false green receipt. The green receipt was created in the 80s for independent workers um, that would decide, doing, for example, architects or lawyers that would, um, so mainly liberal professions, that would decide upon their salary, upon their working hours, would have no bosses and would make a, a very specific one-to-one -one contract for a very specific project. Uh, this means that these people have to pay their own social security, they have to pay their own unemployment fund, um, they have no right to holidays or to sickness leave or whatever. And this form of contractual fraud actually has been as has been used by the Portuguese state massively, for example. So that means that a lot of people in Portugal, the trade union numbers say it's more than the half of the active population, work under precarious circumstances, meaning that most of people have also this form of contractual fraud. They actually should have a contract, their employer should pay for their unemployment fund, should, pl should pay for their social security, they don't. Mm -hmm. Um, so they have to do it themselves. Um, and this means that people that, for example, earn 500 to 600 euros a month have to pay 250 every month to Social Security, which leaves you, of course, no room for maneuvering. And that's a very, very, um, or a completely uh, um, majority experience for young people. I don't know anyone, none of my friends, has ever had a contract. Katharina, these are sort of horrific figures that you supplied, which makes it all the more puzzling that there hasn't been a revolt. No, I don't mean barricades on the streets, though I would love to see them, but uh, I mean a political revolt against the parties of the extreme center which have run uh, uh, Portugal. Uh, why haven't people done something? Well, that's the one million dollar question. There have been important and interesting movements and mobilizations. But, but not reflected politically? No, not reflected politically, yes. Uh, yet, at least. Why haven't these young people who were treated like this been flocking to join the left bloc? That is, the, that is, for me, one of the most important questions because it poses the question of the strategy for the left. What has been happening in the last five years uh, with Bloco, or four, um, since we had a very, very good result in 2009. We I had remember that. 10%. We grew very much. And then there were snap elections in 2011 and we dropped to the half. Could it be that you dropped because people, many young people, perceived you in alliance with the traditional Social Democratic Party for the presidency, for instance? That is, that is a part of the explanation, I think. Um, I think Bloco, as one of the first broad left parties in Europe, had a kind of a dual strategy. One part of it was to conquer the social basis of support of the liberalized traditional social democracy. So to say, this, they're so, the former bigger workers' parties. So to say that the party that you're supporting for 30 years, uh, although in their constitutional, in their manifesto, they say they're social democrats or socialists, they're not anymore. They're liberal parties. And, but the people that support them, a lot of them are very good left-wing trade unionists, are people that st stand and defend the social welfare state, free education, free health care, and so on and so forth. At the same time, it was to convene and to build an alternative for a big fringe of the population that was more radical and was dissatisfied with the political system as it was and as it is. The problem was when we pointed to, the, to both of these uh, groups in, in, in society that are different and have different expectations from political parties, 
we lost them both, I think. So for the people who are members of the Socialist Party for many years, we seem too much like a party not like the others. And be, but because we try to connect with, the, let's say, the anti-capitalist milieu, the social movements, the people that don't vote, the young people that are disappointed with the political system and so on. But for these people, the people that are outside of the political system, so to say, that don't vote and have no trust in parties, we are seen a little bit as too much like a party like the others. So I think this dual strategy uh, failed in both, on both fronts. And so this is the question for us right now. It's, um, I think we need both of these strategies, uh, but the question is where do we focus our priorities? And um, another thing, I'm, I'm bringing Greece uh, again, because um, what I think we can see from what is happening around Europe is that this idea, which has been um, a central idea of all the, the, form, the broad left formations in Europe to undermine the structures of support of the traditional social democracy has actually not worked. That it has only worked when these structures cr crumble themselves. Like the most dramatic example is With PASOK, precisely. <clears throat> so we need parties that's, that, are, that are there, that dispute these people, but I think what we must learn from the experience in Greece and also a little bit of what is happening here in Britain and a little bit what is happening with the PSOE in Spain, so overall a little bit around Europe, is that we need these parties and these structures in order to gather the people when the, the structures, when they destroy themselves. But actually, I, in my opinion, I think our priority should be focusing on the 40% of people that don't vote, on the people that are satisfi unsatisfied with the political system, and to work with them and, to, and with the social movements closer than we, what we have been in the last years. And um, we will have elections this year on the 5th of Oct uh, 4th of October. Already, there's already a date for it. The Socialist Party, um, will probably win. They have not yet been in power. Um, so that's also a difference to Greece. Uh, so the Socialist Party has gained some sort of um, uh, oppositional uh, charm. How? Have they been attacking austerity? No, they signed the memorandum. Oh, yes. But because they haven't yet been in government, they, c they have free hands, clean hands to say, yes, some things we would do, but some things we wouldn't. This is too much, they're going too far. When actually, when you look at the political programs for these elections between the Social Democrats, so the Conservative Party that is in power, and the Socialist Party, which is the liberalized social democracy, they're basically the same. The same. Mm -hmm. There are no differences. Yeah. Um, but they haven't shown that to people yet. So um, people still believe that if they would go into power, that maybe austerity would be different, would not be, or would not, you know, maybe, yes, we need to cut here and there, but there was something, some, this is too much and some things that we would maintain. We call it austeridadezinha in Portuguese, so the little austerity. Um, and I think that is also a little bit our hope or the hope for the left um, is, so I think we need to shift our strategy uh, into working and building roots with the people that are outside of the political systems. And who don't critics, normally vote. And who do, don't <coughs> normally vote. And in Portugal, they're more than 40%. So that's a very big number. And at the same time, have a very clear anti-austerity, um, a critical um, program to the European Union, which is also showing its cracks very clearly right now. And we can't be, we need to change the discourse around the European Union. You see, in my opinion, a large chunk of the left in Europe has become mesmerized by the European Union. Yeah. And there is no basis for this <clears throat> at all, because the European Union has now taken off its mask. There's no big secret. It's a machine for financialized mm -hmm. capitalism. It bans and disallows and forbids even the mildest forms of social democracy. So why should we have anything to do with it? I mean, that's the big question. And I think if as long as the left ignores this, it's the right and the extreme right 
who use popular discontent to attack these structures on chauvinistic, xenophobic grounds. So there has to be an independent campaign of the left saying, yes, we are for European solidarity, but we are not for the EU, which is an instrument of capital, not of labor or anything progressive. Uh, I mean, I, I agree. Uh, there are, um, let me just complexify it a little bit. And I think that's, I think there, there is a part of the European left which has a kind of uh, European fetishism that has been very difficult to break with. Uh, but this European fetishism, especially in the periphery, I would say, has also very clear material groundings. Um, for example, 100% of the budget for science and, re and research in Portugal comes directly from the European Union, 100%. This means the Portuguese state doesn't put one cent into research and education. So this means also, this is the problem with the European Union and to understand the European crisis, I think we cannot just look at the last years from 2007 or 2008, we have to go back and see what has been the process of the so-called European integration. Right, I mean, basically for the periphery countries or the countries of the periphery, it has meant a destruction of our productive sector and to create an economy of services um, and tourism uh, that would import German uh, manufactured products. So our economic structure, our productive structure is very much destroyed for the last 30 years. This was the price we had to pay in order to enter the club of the rich, as the European Union was called in the 80s, right? So I agree that we definitely need to, more than ever, and especially now, as you said, that the European Union has taken off its, its mask and has shown what actually this European project it was, um, that it was not, never a project of um, equality and democracy and so on and so forth, but always a neoliberal project that we need to convene alternatives to this. But at the same time, it is understandable that it is difficult to do it. Um, but precisely because it is difficult to do it and because I think we have an historical opportunity now with what happened just in Greece with the third memorandum, we need to start having a much more clear program to break with this European Union. To that should be added uh, the following thing, that the Eurozone was created supposedly to create an equal Europe and to unite Europe. It's had exactly the opposite impact. It has not equalized anything. Uh, it has shown that even without the Deutschmark, the German economy, which is the largest and most powerful economy in, in Europe, dominates, uh, backed by the French. Uh, and secondly, uh, that the imposition of the euro on countries like Spain, Greece, Ireland, Portugal has had a really negative impact. You know, you can see this in the reports themselves. And there's now a huge discussion within the German elite on what to do with the euro. They know it's a disaster because it's the first time in the history of the world that a currency has been established without a single state administering it. And there's no way they're going to create a single state. The Americans aren't in favor of it and many European countries aren't in favor of it. So they're in a mess and I think they want to restructure the euro. So some of North Euro six or seven North European countries uh, will be part of it and the, the rest way. out. Mm -hmm. So why wait for them to do it? Why not plan it ourselves? Which is why the huge opportunity was missed in Greece recently. May I just add something about the euro? Sure. Um, the, I think the interesting and at the same time very strange thing about the euro is that within the introduction of the euro, for example, the German mark was devalorized in comparison to all the other national currencies in order to make their, in order to lower uh, the labor value and to lower their, the, the prices of their exports. So the euro was an instrument to make the German economy stronger and more central and to make the, per the peripheral economies more dependent on the center of Europe. So it was never a tool for equalizing anything. It was actually a tool to reinforce the already existing uh, inequalities. And, but I think Bloco is going in a good direction. 
Um, what are the opinion polls showing at the moment? We will do badly in the elections. We need to be very clear about oh. this. We will do badly in the elections. We will probably go, we will either stay more or less in the same percentage as we had in 2011, which is around five, but it is possible that we lose some members of parliament even. Um, but at the same time, there, there is a shift on the political line of Bloco. So this, this ideas are, are becoming more clear. So our political program has as a central motto, no more sacrifices for the Euro, which I think is the correct motto to put. I think it's hard within a country um, whose productive sector has been massively destroyed. Unemployment is massively, precarity is huge, migration is very big, um, and people are very scared of going back to a national currency because it would mean even more devaluation of salaries um, and so on and so forth. And so for a shorter term, probably at least for a, per a period of some years, maybe, I'm not an economist and I cannot predict this precisely, but probably for a period of some years, even if not many, um, strengthen of, of uh, the, the poverty levels. Um, at the same time, what we know and what is very clear right now is that austerity is worse than this because austerity has no solution. Austerity is, is not only a political program to completely destroy labor rights and social rights, but the, and, and it's based on, on the debt, on this debt that is unpayable. So now, for example, our memorandum is over, but the Troika will be coming every six months to Portugal to do evaluations until 2021, I think. And sooner or later, we'll have to get another memorandum because the debt is unpayable and it's only growing in percentage to the GDP. Um, so um, the question is, can we, um, the conditions that we will have to face if we leave the Eurozone, um, are not good, <laughs> we have to say no. it, are not good, but the, the conditions that we will have to face if we stay within it will be worse in time. And they will get worse and worse Precisely. and worse, whereas if you leave the euro, they will be very bad for the first year, and then if the economy is properly handled, they could improve. That's the uh, dilemma mm -hmm. which the small countries in Europe face, but it, it's a dilemma which has to be grabbed. Uh, Katharina, tell me a bit about yourself. Uh, what is your family background? When did you decide to become an activist and why? What happened was when I was 14, um, there was a very big uh, high school student movement in Portugal um, against uh, a new educational reform that had to do not only with cuts but also with the restructuring of some, a part of the way that um, schools are organized. So the high schools in Portugal are, were, they are not anymore, uh, very democratic because there are structures that come still from the revolutionary process. So students participated in the pedagogic boards of the schools, the scientific boards of the school. There was a school assembly which was composed by equal numbers of students, teachers and workers that de decided the daily life of how high schools went. And so there was um, um, a reform, an educational reform that wanted to dismantle this. It was a lot of things, but this was also one of them. I lived one year in Norway with my mom when I was 13 to 14, and when I came back to my school, there, there was a movement starting, and I decided to join. I thought it made sense. Um, so that's how I started in the high school, when I was 14, 14 to 15. When I was 15, I joined Bloco. So you joined the left Bloc when you were 15? Yes. <laughs> and you have remained there. And I've so remained there ever, ever since. <laughs> Katharina, we shall follow what happens in Portugal closely, hopefully with your help, but thank you very much. Thank you.